how the music has that effect on your body, it, like literally your pulse. Like you have to, just like when you go to the gym, you got to warm your body up. There's a point when you get to the peak of your lifting or, or your personal record, your personal best, and then you have to have a cool down and you got to stretch and then you have to refeed your body. You have to give it some nourishment. So all of those pieces also belong inside your performance. You got to do that for yourself. You got to do that for you know your band members or whoever else is performing with you. And you also have to do that for your audience. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining me today. I am Lindsay Renee and thank you Davina for having me and hosting me um, for this webinar. Um, if you guys don't mind telling me where you are joining us from, if you wanna put that in the chat, that would be awesome. I'm currently in Atlanta uh, and I'm a choreographer, dancer, performer, performance coach, movement director, creative director, and a uh, dance educator. I wear a lot of hats. Hey, DC. Okay, Virginia. ATL in the house. Merlin. Okay. <laughs> nice. All right. So glad to have all of you. You said Merlin. You, you said Merlin. Right. You said it right. You said it right. <laughs> you got to say it right. Oh, we got Ohio. Okay. My home state, DC. I love it. I love it. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, things that enhance your performance quality. One of the number one things that enhance your performance quality is movement. Um, some people are completely afraid to move. <laughs> and then some people, if you're anything like me, oh, we got New Orleans too. Yes. <laughs> if you're like me, you can't stop moving. So uh, as a child, I was told to stop moving more than I was told to move. So here we go. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. I want you guys to think about what was the first performance, whether it was on TV, you saw the video, it was on your phone, you were live in person, which is always my favorite, first performance of any kind that absolutely had you like in a state of ecstasy. Like you just didn't want it to stop. You could not <laughs> take your eyes off the stage. You don't want to be bothered. You probably almost didn't even want to sing along. Like you were just transfixed in that moment. And everything else that was going around you stopped. Like sensory overload had taken over your entire world. And you were like, ah, this is what I want to do. Like, what was that moment for you? Do you remember where you were? <laughs> Michael Jackson, yes. Do you remember where you were? Where were you watching? I'm gonna give you guys a second to put that in the chat. Grandma's house on MTV, yep. <laughs> what was that moment that made you feel like, you know what, I this is what I wanna do. The way that these people make, pink. Yes, Ailey Revelations. Wow, yeah. What was that moment that made you feel like, you know what, this is how I want to make people feel, Shakira. Okay, so as you guys continue to, to tell me who these people or these uh, performances were, mine was The Wiz. So um, it changed my entire life. I probably was about eight or nine years old. My grandmother had had taken me and fly girls in living color, absolutely, had taken me and uh, my mother to go see The Wiz. The, the performance of The Wiz, I think it was like the touring Broadway performance, Blue Man Group. Oh, that's a good one. And <laughs> while we were there, um, Tony Terry was the Scarecrow. Peebo Bryson was The Wiz. And Grace Jones was Eveline. Can you feel a brand new day? Absolutely, euphoric. And the entire time, like I could not, I didn't even get up to go to the bathroom during an intermission. I couldn't tell you if I had to go or not. Like I was so glued. Everything from the costumes, the lighting, the movement, of course, the music, I was so hooked. And so at the end of it, um, wherever we had parked, it was right across from the uh, tour bus. And at that moment, 
my mother and my grandmother, we ran across the street so I could get autographs and I got to meet um, Tony Terry. And, you know, I, I said, you know, I really love the, the show. And he said, well, well, we hope that, you know, you'll get to do something like that someday in the future, you know, for yourself. And when we got in the car, I was completely silent. So we're driving home and my mother is kind of concerned. She keeps turning around in her seat and she's looking like, what is going on? Like, are you OK? Because she thought I was sad. I had this crazed look in my eyes like I had seen a ghost <laughs> and she just she couldn't figure it out. And finally, I think we we finally, you know, parked the car and I just burst into tears. And I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. And as dramatic and real as that moment was, I knew deep down inside that I wanted to perform. So you guys want to continue sharing more of what uh, brand new day. I can understand that. Yes. <laughs> So one of the things that happened, though, was I was completely overtaken by the performance quality. Every single part, every single person was absolutely <laughs> impactful in that moment for me. And so one of the things that um, performers, especially music artists, want to be able to do is to transform the experience that their audiences have. Any performer, dance, actors, musicians, you wanna be able to transform the experience that your audience has so that they feel <laughs> like your five-year-old self, Jay. You know, they feel like the way that you did when you decided that this is what you wanted to do for your life. So uh, so how, how do I know, <laughs> how do I know this? Well, I had lots of training. Um, I went and studied dance at Howard University, got my BFA there, um, went on to dance in a concert dance company, uh, Garth Bang and Dance. Any of you seen The Lion King on Broadway, if you have? H.U. in the building, yes. <laughs> if you have seen um, The Lion King on Broadway, the choreographer, of the Lion King, his name is Garth Fagan, and he's had a dance company for over 50 years. Now, yes, Lion King is amazing, and it is still on Broadway and touring around the world, actually. Um, and so I got to dance in his company uh, for quite a, quite a few years. And then from that, um, I gained a lot of experience, but I also started doing musical theater. I got to choreograph for musical theater. I've been able to create films, <laughs> dance films. Um, so I've had my hands in all of these different spaces on the creating part as well as the performance part. Um, more recently, you may have been able to see me for this many seconds um, in Coming to America too, where I was one of the dancers. I've had the opportunity to teach on college level dance. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what um, happens inside the training is you know we're we're utilizing all of the different parts of us that are vulnerable and the body doesn't lie <laughs> so all the things that that you think the audience doesn't know about you they just might because of how you're moving so those are the kinds of things that that I've been able to help other dancers also understand so and then eventually I went and got a master's in choreography so all of this to say I do know a little bit <laughs> about what I'm talking about. Um, all of these years of experience, I've been able to see not just how movement affects people who get to view it, but also the people who are moving. There's times when you can tell by somebody's body language that they don't want to be there. You can tell by somebody's body language um, if they've been paid attention to, just even like with kids. You can see it in the classroom. You can see it across the dance floor when they're taking class. How much attention have they been paid to in a day or just throughout their life? They're the ones that really, really, really are starving for the attention that you can give them in a dance class. And some of this is also going to be true for your audience, just letting you know that. So one of the things that I think is extremely important is that movement is not just a physical thing. Uh, my first dance teacher, Karen Green, uh, she told me and my other um, friends that were also in, in class and in the dance group that every 
word, excuse me, every movement on earth is also a word in heaven. And so if you think about it in, in the sense of the things that we do physically, they're connected to a completely different plane that many of us don't understand. So regardless of what your belief system is, you have to understand that, <laughs> that there's another part of this that's being communicated. And so with that comes a great deal of responsibility. So one of the things that I like to be mindful of is how are things being communicated? You know, I'm sure you guys have seen um, people posing in magazines and it's like, okay, how did they arrive to this pose? And what, <laughs> what is the meaning <laughs> of this gesture? What is the, <laughs> what was that about? Sometimes it's an accident and other times it's extremely purposeful. You know, um, the, the way that you move across the stage, the way people see you in a video, the way that movement even starts decides where the, the audience's eye goes. You know, a lot of times um, because we read from right to left. So when you're on stage, it might be best to do things from left to right because your left on stage is the audience's right. In terms of how they're going to follow you, things that you have to be mindful of. So all of that to say, <laughs> movement <laughs> has a huge effect on how we process information as well as the actual information that you get. So who all uses movement? Here's a list, it's a short list, but I'm sure you guys can add to this. If you guys can think of any other people that, that use movement. We got conductors, choir directors, band directors, stage managers, quarterbacks, point guards. Who else, who else uses movement? Lots of people use movement. Traffic directors, yeah, <laughs> they do. I had to stop for traffic today. Sign language interpreters, soldiers, yes. All of these people, wrestlers, <laughs> they sure do. The coaches on the sidelines. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't know if any of you have seen referees. Oh yeah, they're always doing a bunch of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. they have to memorize a lot. Um, it's a whole different language even. And so, HBCU dance band leaders, the dance line, they absolutely <laughs> are using movement to give different cues. So if you had the opportunity to be able to control every single thing that's happening on the stage, martial artists, yes. If you had the opportunity to control every single thing that's happening on the stage simply by using your own body, absolutely preachers, would you take that opportunity to do it? <laughs> I certainly would. Yeah, it's a good good thing to be able to do. So, oh, here we go. Okay, <laughs> movement as an experience. So um, I wanna say, I'm not gonna tell you how many years ago this was, but I happened to be on tour uh, in Germany with a dance company. On the way there, I saw Bilal in the airport. And I was like, hmm, he, I think he might be on my flight. Meanwhile, <laughs> say that again. Meanwhile, he did not have his locks anymore. So I think he had literally just cut them because I kept on looking and I'm like, mm, the last time I saw, you know, a picture of him, he had locks. This is, you know, today he doesn't have them. So gets on the plane. I, I think I said, I said hi to him and his manager and, you know, just went about my business, have my own little little uh, fan moment. On the return trip, he was also on the flight. So now I'm I'm talking to other castmates and I'm like, guys, I think this is really Bilal. And they're like, no, no, he has locks. I was like, oh, here we go again. So, <laughs> so anyway, long story short, I end up um, talking to him and he ended up going back to DC, which is where I was going back to uh, actually to finish school, finish the semester. And <laughs> I asked, I said, hey, you know, are you performing anywhere? And so his manager was like, yeah, you know, give us a call. We'll get, we'll get you tickets. So me and my friends, we got tickets. Great. We're all in the front. You know, we got tickets to see Bilal. One of the things that was so heartbreaking was 
at one point he asked the audience because he was, he had been singing a lot of his, I guess, new material. And I guess at this point it's old because it was quite a while ago, but he was singing a lot of his new material and the audience did not seem to be as responsive to him. And I remember at one point when he asked the audience, they, they were screaming, you know, some of his hits, but it was really old at that point. And I remember thinking like, how heartbreaking is it that he has all this new material and his audience that really loves him and came to see him, he's not able to share it with them because they're not being, they're not receptive at all. (laughs) So where, yes, art is subjective, but there's an objective part where you have to satisfy in some cases, the audience that came to see you. Unfortunately, he was not able to put those two pieces together, at least not in that moment. And it was hard to watch because I was just like, man, like I would I would hate to be in a place where I had to do the same thing over and over and over again, regardless of how much new material I have. I have to do the same thing over and over and over again. And um, years later, I got to see uh, most deaf. In fact, I had gone to the concert. I think it was his goodbye tour. Anybody remember that? It's like his goodbye tour or final farewell tour. I think it might have what it was called. And I got to see it at the Kennedy Center. And um, it was amazing because this is when I got to see an artist utilize what I call subjective objectivity. So the subjective part is the objective part is you have this overall task that you have to complete. So if you're working with a director, there's a certain thing that you have to do that they're asking for you to do, whether it's memorize lines, (laughs) whether it's complete, um, this part of the, the choreography a certain way, or if it's hit this specific note at this particular time, like whatever that thing is that you must do and you must do it consistently. Then there's a subjective part where you have to find something inside all of that that you are objectively having to do to satisfy yourself. So the subjective objectivity that I was able to witness from most deaf, he was having the time of his life. Uh, I believe Robert Glasper was actually one of the uh, musicians that was playing with him. At the Kennedy Center, he had all of these different screens up. And there was um, there were pictures and video of the um, different Tuskegee experiments that were going on, like some of the lab documents you could see. Um, Henrietta Lacks. There were all of these different things. So there was like a subliminal uh, messaging visually happening at one point. Then the entire time he's singing and dancing. I don't think he stopped moving. By the time that, <laughs> by the time that the show was over, he was completely drenched in sweat. And this was the second time that I was completely transfixed. He had all of these different things going. There were there were live musicians on the stage. There were screen project projections. He had, um, if you've ever been to the Kennedy Center in certain theaters, actually on the stage are some of the seats, but they're in the balcony. So he had, you know, all of his people who were there, you know, like his homies um, cheering him on. Like he could literally just, you know, point at them and see them really closely. They're there. So we can see some of that, some of that interaction. And then at any given point, he had other people coming on the stage, sharing the stage with him to perform one of his hits. So you had all of this going on, but he still maintained, he maintained control of everything. He was signaling the entire time. He was telling people (laughs) to bring sound up. He was telling people to move things off the stage, but none of that distracted you from what was actually happening in his performance. So the subjective objectivity part came in towards the end. I realized that he had done everything that he wanted to do in that show. He had changed clothes. (laughs) He had uh, danced with a couple audience members and he kept saying, you guys, I'm glad that you're here experiencing experiencing this with me, 
but this is really for me. Yes, Carlos Santana does perform like that. He's another person that does that, another artist that does that. And so what I would also like to be able to, to help you all do is figure out what your sub subjective objectivity needs to be so that yes, you can continue to carry your crowd, maintain control of your performance and still be able to enjoy it for yourself. Movement can do that. Hey, real quick guys, if you have any questions or anything like that, you can throw them in the Q&A or in the chat. Either one is perfect. And also, uh, are you guys understanding what's going on? Are you guys getting all this great information? Because, Lindsay, you're really good at this. Oh, <laughs> you are amazing. Like, I just, oh my goodness. You are so good. Like, I'm actually really, really in it. And I've been taking notes. And I don't even oh. perform. I don't <laughs> perform. But I am now. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt. Please go no, ahead. No, thank you. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I certainly appreciate that, V. Thank you. Um, you know, going back a little bit, the indescribable feeling that that most deaf created and, you know, completely being transparent, I had a huge crush on most deaf and it just, it was probably magnified or excuse me amplified <laughs> by that by that experience but I couldn't do anything but see him as an artist and I think that especially in a time like right now where the streaming the the interwebs we all did yes thank you thank you <laughs> and during a time where there's so much um being like oversaturation of you said boom <laughs> of there's so much oversaturation of um what people are expecting you to put out i think that he is a great example at least in that performance and i can't speak for his entire career but at least in that performance where he was really really um convicted and um committed to his own work and so you know, I know you guys have seen artists where they're, you know that they're a great recording artist, but you're not so sure that they're a great performing artist because they didn't necessarily pull you in the way that you would like them to. Or, you know, when you get back, it's like you can't even listen to the, the album the same because what you experienced in person, that's not what you want. <laughs> that is not what you want to happen. And a lot of it has to do with that, that whole subjective objectivity and being able to control and enjoy what's happening in the moment on the stage or on the screen. So artists have the power to make moves. So uh, there's a lot of music that when you hear it, it does make you wanna, wanna move. There, when you hear it, there's um, something about it that you literally cannot let go of. There's a clip that's on, it's on YouTube, but it's also, I've seen it a million times on Instagram where Barry White is talking about how, you know, the music starts and that when that drum beat hits, that's your heart, that's your pulse. And then when you, when you hear the piano, that's the rhythm. That's the thing that, that makes you really, really give in to the movement that your body wants to do. Yes, go-go does that. Have mercy. It absolutely does. And so at some point, you have to realize that your music is powerful enough to make people physically move, but also to create movements. So when you think about the movement, the civil rights movement and the music, the soundtrack of that, that was some powerful music, which also means that you have a responsibility. When you think about even more recently, Black Lives Matter, there's quite a few artists who have pinned songs that are completely um, part of the soundtrack of that current movement. Bob Marley is a great example, liberation. 
So in order to do that, and, and also in order to make sure that your impact is reaching the kinds of objectives that you want it to, when people see you performing that, they need to also want to move, which means that you have to move. <laughs> yes, every word. So who wants to move with me? Let's make that happen. Um, I will share a link in a little bit, but you guys can, you'll be able to book a call to be able to do a one-on-one -on -one session to figure out, okay, what is the best way to go about helping you move? Um, whether that means developing a plan so that you have your own personal movement vocabulary. There's plenty of times where, <laughs> yes, 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 love to move with you. Absolutely, please. There's plenty of times where you don't necessarily have to have a choreographed dance for your, you know, four minute ballad, but there's certain points where you have to connect your body to the words that you're singing. There's certain points where you have to be able to guide the audience on how to move. I'm sure you've heard songs where it took you a good, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds in to figure out, okay, do I ride this rhythm or do I ride this one? Should there be a clap involved here? I don't know. My body wants to do something. I'm not really sure what it's supposed to do. You have the chance to decide. And I want to help you. Oh, man. So, so I do have a question. Yes. We we're talking about, you know, most F and how his performance, because he had the screens and, you know, he was moving. And the same thing with Carlos Santana, he would put, you know, African dancers and drummers on the screen behind him. And I was just in awe by the performance. One of the best performances I've ever seen. Um, how can an artist obtain that without, because both examples had screens. And I think that's what, you know, had us in awe because mm -hmm. it was the subliminal in the back that was like teaching us something, but also yes. they were moving and the band was moving. And how can an artist obtain that without having access to the same things that those two artists have? So, you know, um, <laughs> a couple of things, utilize your resources, right? So everyone has a friend that dances well. And that friend that dances well knows other dancers. So being able to utilize, you know, the people that are right next to you. And I'm not saying that you bargain for exposure because no other, no more artists need to be paid with exposure. Let's just put that out there, right? But that's somewhere that you can start. So being able to choreograph, like I've been able to choreograph for some of my friends and their projects. And that not only gave me access to music that I was able to use, uh, royalty-free music that I was able to use, but also um, an opportunity to collaborate with other kinds of artists. So that's one thing. Um, and then you don't necessarily need a Santana or a, a most deaf budget to be able to do those things. Um, and if you're working with me personally, <laughs> I can make sure that we build uh, a team. So based on budget, but also based on what the, the needs are of your specific performance, whether it's for your music video, photo shoot, um, appearance, live performance, that those things can be in place and, and we can build that so it can happen. And then I think another thing about um, artists like Santana and Most Def, the reason why you were not distracted by it was because they knew how to build the pace of their show. Hmm. So there's just even in that same way that Barry White describes how the music has that effect on your body, it, like literally your pulse. Like you have to, just like when you go to the gym, you gotta warm your body up. There's a point when you get to the peak <laughs> of your lifting or, or your personal record, your personal best, and then you have to have a cool down and you gotta stretch. And then you have to refeed your body. You have to give it some nourishment. So all of those pieces, also belong inside your performance. You got to do that for yourself. You got to do that for, you know, your band members or whoever else is performing with you. And you also have to do that for your audience. 
You ever been to a, a, a show where you felt like you were just dropped off a cliff? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Where's the rest? No. <laughs> and hopefully they come back for an encore. You know, that's another trick that they use. Mm-hmm. There's certain artists that you go see and you know that no matter what, there's going to be an encore. It's fine. Uh, it's only been 45 minutes. It's supposed to be an hour. Don't worry. We'll, we'll wait. <laughs> We'll but back. again, it has to do with pacing. Yeah. Would you say I'm sorry? And so they, they're like, we'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I think- uh, so uh, Shay said, is there a such thing as bad movement in a performance? Examples of dance related and non dance related movement. Oh, I would, yeah, I would say, I would say yes. I would say that um, when when I think of the word bad movement, I'm thinking one that does not effectively communicate what you want it to. So that could be that could be anything. So again, being intentional um, and specific about your movement language, whether it's your posture, just standing there singing a ballad, <laughs> or swaying. You know, at some point, everybody got their cell phones up with the flashlight on, like whatever that is, it it can, you know, if it's not um, purposeful and I'm going to use the word appropriate for for what it is, the setting is and your pacing, then yes, it could be bad. (laughs) When should you stop? When it comes to age. I don't think that you should. And if you ask Smokey Robinson right now, he's going to say never if you've seen any of (laughs) <laughs> have you seen any of the videos Smokey is giving it to him okay he really is everywhere okay everywhere <laughs> that's a beautiful so, thing <laughs> yeah yeah and you know dancing keeps you young I don't know if, if you guys have ever seen some dancers that are have retired but they still do dance recreationally they look amazing yeah all right. So Slash said, how important is developing and growing with a dance team around an artist versus more dance for a higher type performance based on the show type? Say that. I'm going to read it. How important is developing and growing with a dance team around an artist versus more dancers for higher type performance based on show? Ah, so cohesion, right? So um if you think about even like a, a music band where there's people that drop in and out all the time, they might know the music, but the cohesion of the band is not necessarily consistent. And so um, when you're dealing with chemistry and being able to build a, a dance group, you do, you know, ideally want to be able to, to work with some of the same dancers so that there's a chemistry and connection that happens on and off the stage because it's going to be apparent again in the body. Um, it doesn't always happen that way, but it is definitely an ideal situation. Um, and then the other part of the question was, so getting dancers based on the show type. Um, so right now, uh, dancers have to be able to do all kinds of things. They have to be able to tap. They have to be able to do hip hop. They have to be able to go on point. Like they have to be be able to do a lot of different kinds of things. So getting a diverse group or a a group of diverse um, and versatile dancers is quite possible. Um, And I think that probably just depends on what you want, you know, what kind of, of look, what kind of aesthetic, what kind of vibe you want to have. Over in the Q and A, any key tips or movements uh, that you can use to engage your audience? Uh, yes, if you book a call with me, I can tell you all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that one of the things that that is challenging, especially if you don't have someone looking at what is going to work best for you and your body. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, emulating other people until you figure out what your vibe, what your quote unquote swag is. But um, having somebody that can pay attention to you to be able to help you develop that organically, it's definitely beneficial. 
as a singer, I've always felt a disconnect between when I'm singing and my movement on stage. What advice would you give on bridging the gap? So I think a couple of things. And when I do consultations with people, these are some of the kind of questions that, that I do ask. But when you think about when you go to the gym, what kind of music do you listen to? When you are in your car, what kind of, list, what kind of music do you listen to? When you are chilling at the house, doing, you know, maybe cleaning up, doing chores, what kind of music do you listen to? In all of those different scenarios, you move differently. And so you have to think about how do I need to move based on the song and its purpose? That's part of how you can connect uh, the movement, but also by giving me a call. What advice would you have on, oh, okay, that's the same one. Um, but it's a lot of times it has to do with how you're looking at movement and dancing or movement and singing, movement and the music. They can't be separate. They have to be together. What kind of budget would you say is suitable for hiring dancers to elevate your performance? Or if there isn't a specific amount, any thoughts on that? So there are industry rates. Um, so there are certain rates that you can provide that are based on the industry standards. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the level of dancers that you're asking. But also, depends on how, how much dancing you have them doing, how much rehearsing. So I would say that while you want to be able to pay them as close to the rate as possible. If you're working with people that you know, try to find you know something that um, you can negotiate until you're able to accommodate them in a larger budget. But again, the, the numbers would depend on how long are they dancing? Um, how many rehearsals do they have to, be, to go to? Um, are they going to be preparing for a tour? Are you using it, them specifically for a video or performance? Are all those things going to be happening at the same time? Eventually, are they going to be going on the road with you? Like a lot of the, the same things that apply to um, any other performers that you're bringing along, whether they're band members, they would apply to the dancers as well. Did I answer all of them? Was uh, that the Deborah is clarifying what she meant. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I think everybody is dancing now. So yeah, everyone's dancing. And a lot of the a lot of the dances that are being done now, and this is getting into my dance educator hat, um, a lot of the dances that you see on TikTok and, and Instagram, they're the popular dances. So they're not necessarily the um, traditional dances that are being done for like a specific purpose, specific ritual, ceremony, um, or even just by a specific group of people. Um, a lot of what you're seeing is a watered down or a consumable version of the dances that are being done. So they're literally, if, you, if you're seeing it on Instagram, more than likely it's so that anybody can do it. <laughs> if you're seeing it on TikTok, more than likely it's so that anybody can do it. If you're trying to pull from a spe specific tradition, um, I think it's important that you talk to the people that practice that tradition, you um, study with them, and by studying, you also can decide whether or not this is something that should be mainstream or if it needs to be, it needs to stay under the protection of the people that are part of that tradition. And I think that goes for any um, cultural dance, regardless of what the ethnicity or um, ethnic group is. Yeah. Nice. And I think, you know, you just, you have to be respectful of the fact that dance is a, uh, a piece of like cultural continuum. So it's one of the things that is part of the, the evidence that a people existed, just like music is, just like art is, um, you know, recipes are. <laughs> They're all of those things are that are part of an intrinsic to culture are an evidence that they existed. And so making sure that we are uh, respectful of that existence and the um, continuation of it. I think, do we have another one? 
Yeah. So Nola asked, do you have any tips on getting over uh, stage fright, getting comfortable on stage? Oh, yes. <laughs> one of my one of my favorites. Um, I do remember. And I don't even know if I ever told anybody that this is what I was doing. I do remember when um, I was on tour and at this point we had gone to a lot of places that I didn't see anybody that looked anything like <laughs> anybody I was related to. Okay. For a while in the audience, it was, it was quite a few cities like that. And I started placing my family members in the audience mentally because I knew that if I'm dancing with them, you know, people that, that I'm very comfortable with being around people that I love people that no matter what, I know that they support who I am, what I am, regardless of how many terms I did and did not do, <laughs> then that that built a level of comfort for me. And so I think that when you start piecing the thing that you love with um, people, things, ideas, or experiences that are very familiar and comforting, that's a good way to start getting over your stage fright. And it could even be, you know, you starting your own ritual where some, and I'm sure you've probably heard about people have very strange things in their riders. It's like, I have to have this specific type of water. Um, I remember, <laughs> I won't say who it was, but I, I went to Howard University. I was working at the, um, uh, the auditorium, uh, Crampton Auditorium on campus. And um, uh, me and, and quite a few of the dance majors, we were the ushers because it's a great way to see the shows for free. So <laughs> particular time, it was probably around homecoming. I think it was homecoming. There was a particular artist that was not coming out to perform. It was a group. They were not coming out to perform until they had a very specific brand of water because that's what was in their rider. And I found out later that it had to do with a ritual. It was me who went to CVS <laughs> down the street <laughs> and got a case <laughs> of that very specific brand of water. Um, and so, but, you know, knowing that that was a part of the ritual, it, it, it was, um, it was comical, but it was also, it was very serious because that's what these particular individuals needed to be able to complete whatever the ritual was. So I don't know if they threw the water all over their face. I don't know what they did <laughs> with that water. They just all had, you know, one bottle of the same water or whatever, but that's what they needed, you know, before they could go out on stage. I don't know. I don't think that had anything to do with stage fright, but I'm just saying building your own ritual, whatever that needs to be for you is, is a good way to um, go about trying to break away from the things that are scaring you about this wonderful thing that you want to experience and be able to share on the stage. Um, in the Q and A, what are the best clothes, shoes, materials suitable for movement on stage? Oh, that almost seems like a trick question <laughs> because <laughs> most of the time, the thing that you enjoy being able to rehearse in is usually not, not at all <laughs> like what you were going to perform in. Um, and I think that's actually uh, another thing about, about performing, you know, if you have the opportunity to choose based on more than just aesthetic, think about what is going to allow you to move. Like, I'm sure you've, you have seen people on award shows, even, um, I remember I went to see uh, black girls rock, uh, the live recording. I think it was, it was in Queens, Queens, New York is where some theater that that was there. It was beautiful theater. And um, there was, I won't say the artist because I don't want to embarrass her, but <laughs> there was an artist, beautiful voice. When she came out, I was thinking she can't even walk in these shoes. She can't walk in these shoes and this dress is unforgiving. And probably when she got to maybe the bridge of the song, she fell. And because it was a record, yeah, it happened. Yeah. I mean, and she she had her choreography. It was simple, but it was not for the shoes. Right. <laughs> All the shocked faces. Um, and so 
I think that when, when, when it got to the end of the song, they made an announcement and they asked the audience if they would allow her to redo her song. And of course, everybody clapped and was cheering her on and everything. But yeah, costuming ha- plays, a, yeah, choose wisely. Okay, okay, yeah. That's why Patti LaBelle takes hers off every chance she gets. She sure does. And she she changes, she changes like three or four times. She changes wigs, she changes clothes, and she changes shoes at least three times as many times as she does all those other things. And has her hand mirror on the stage. Cause what you're not gonna do is catch Patty slipping. <laughs> oh man, these are all great questions. Really great questions. So how do they get in contact with you? Do you want all right? to put yes. it all in the community. Um, if they are not in the community, you can share it here yeah. in the chat. Um, and then emails, I can make sure uh, the information yes. is sent out to all of the emails. Yep, let me go ahead and do that now. I'm gonna pull this link up. Um, so you can schedule a call with me here. And then I'll also um, share it in uh, Geneva. Man, thank you so much. This was amazing. (laughs) I learned a lot. Um, This was, you never know how much goes into certain things. When you see people dancing, take Rihanna during the halftime show, it like the people in white were doing so much. Yes. Yes, they were. They were they were doing a whole lot. And, you know, big ups to Rihanna, because if I am just a little bit outside, if I'm in holiday weight in terms of my body (laughs) and it's just me. Jumping around or even being on something that raises to I don't know how many feet in like people don't realize that she still had to balance herself. She wasn't just like, oh, just standing there. She's literally ascending into the air, which means that she's experiencing gravity in a way that nobody else is. And she's pregnant. And she's pregnant. Right. (laughs) At one point at the very end, the side went, I don't know if anybody else saw that, but I was like, ooh. Yeah, I think somebody screenshotted it and had posted it. And yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know it's very easy to criticize, but none of us know. I mean, the artists do, but even at Mm -hmm. this level, when you get to that level, you don't know what goes into performing and, you know, being healthy. Like you said, the singing and the Mm -hmm. movement happens at the same time. Well, you got to be able to breathe. Okay. Like, and you have to be able to find breath in your body that allows you to move. Because, you know, anything can happen. (laughs) Like, I don't, like, to this day, uh, Janet Jackson, back in the day, the way she moved and the way she would still sing. And Chris Brown, that boy flips all over the stage. I mean, he is climbing trees and he is still on point, in my opinion. Yeah, Yeah. not missing a beat, not a single count. Full out. Pull out Fatima all the time. And the whole the whole concert. And I've never seen him in concert, but the clips, one song, one song, I'm like, oh, I'm tired for you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even with Janet, um, uh, when she did her residency in Vegas, she was going up those stairs singing and then jumping into choreography and they were changing her. And then she's coming down more stairs <laughs> and continue singing and going into to choreography. Yeah. Yeah. What was the hardest performance for you? Do you have um, one specific performance that was very, very hard? Ah, okay. Um, tour that I did uh, in a dance company with um, in Austria because my by the time I got adjusted to the time difference, 
we were gone. <laughs> so that that really played a, a weird trick on me. And then the way that the um, the lighting was in that particular theater, I don't think I've ever experienced it anywhere else in any other theater was the way that the um, the backdrop or the, the psych was set up and the lighting on the proscenium, the front of the stage, it looked the same. So if you didn't know exactly where you were at the beginning and towards the end of the turn, you could end up facing back to the back of the stage, thinking that you were facing the audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, and, and I think, you know, with the jet lag and being disoriented on stage, it just made it very, very hard. And the dressing room that I had, now that I'm even thinking about this, the dressing room that I had was extremely far from the stage. And I had a lot of changes and most of them were quick. Yeah. Uh, Deborah said, was your hardest dance lightning rod? Uh, <laughs> um, I, think, I think the process, so um, I got to, uh, do a project with Wynton Marcellus uh, Septet that was premiered at BAM and Brooklyn um, Academy of Music in New York and uh, live, well, yeah, live, <laughs> live music, dancing to live music, dancing to live music is very different than the track as I'm sure any performer knows. The energy that you get from live music, there's nothing like it. But what often happens, if you've ever been in uh, an African dance class, you might notice that the rhythm that you started off with, it ends up getting much faster by the end <laughs> of the combination because the musicians, they get a little excited. They just start doing their own thing and not at all thinking about the dancers who were dancing. So some of those same things happened uh, with jazz musicians as well. So where the, par the parts where they're supposed to have maybe their, their solos or their improv sections, certain music cues that I was supposed to hear, they didn't necessarily show up. Or the tempo <laughs> that we had practiced with <laughs> had gone on lunch. So, so yeah, I think um, it was also probably one of my favorites though, uh, to be able to perform, yeah. That was gonna be my final. What was your absolute favorite performance? Uh, absolute and favorite. That just lives rent free in your head. All of them? <laughs> no, I think so. Uh, my aunt, I have an, a great aunt. My grandmother's one of my grandmother's sisters. She lives in her, her and my uncle, they live in uh, North Carolina, right outside of Greensboro. And we had a performance. I don't even remember what city we were in. I think maybe we were in Charlotte and she had her church rent a bus. <laughs> <laughs> had her church rent a bus. There were like, you know, 60, 70 people on that bus. And then there was also a caravan of people that came. That particular show was completely sold out thanks to my auntie. Um, and that particular show, I remember there was, there was a set of turns that had been giving me the blues for quite a minute. And I was just like, this is another opportunity. Um, I can't remember who asked about how do you get over, you know, some of your stage fright that I was like, they're actually in the audience. I'm getting these turns. <laughs> so I would say that's probably one of my, um, most memorable uh, performances because I got those turns. Yeah, that's, that's my grandmother actually flew down uh, for that for that show too. Mm -hmm. Grandma and auntie for the win, for sure. Always. <laughs> always. Well, thank yeah. you so 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 much. Um, the link is in the chat, guys, and Lindsay will put it in the um, yep, also in, in the community in Geneva. Sweet. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. This was amazing. Oh, do you teach dance classes? I do. I do. I don't have any currently that are open to the public, but uh, I do offer private lessons 
um, and I will be over the summer as well. Hey, thanks. <laughs> I will yep. be really. That's when you come on. <laughs> <laughs> he is not allowed. He will be doing Michael Jackson <laughs> dance moves all around. When I say sliding, that is you do moonwalking everywhere. I mean, Che said that he wanted to be moonwalking too into a backflip. So they might have like a duet happening. Yeah, I don't know. Do that that makes sense. It does. It yes. makes sense. I can actually, <laughs> he said, listen. <laughs> Man, thank everybody for coming out. Um, yeah, this was dope. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. All right, guys. Bye. See you next week.